begin with the prayer for studying Torah. So we're going to begin 
with the whole question of tithing, the tithe. What is the tithe? In their particular tithe is from 10, if one gives 10% of what one has. Okay, so let's let's figure out what exactly that 10% is and what it means and where do we get this idea. So we'll start um, in Deuteronomy and we'll look at chapter 14 starting with verse 22. I didn't write down the page number, but it, this is a good exercise. You should always know how to look up the biblical I gave it to you in English. 27 to 29, just so we understand. But, but do not neglect the family of the Levite in your community, for he has no hereditary portion as you have. Every third year you shall bring out the full tithe of your yield of that year, but leave it within your settlement. Then the family of the Levite, who has no hereditary portion as you have, and the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow in your settlement shall come and eat their fill so that your God Adonai may bless you in all the enterprises you undertake. Okay. That's really clear, isn't it? <laughs> Is it? Does everybody understand it? Okay, let's, let's, what, what's confusing about it? Let's try to figure out so we know what we're talking about. Yeah. Question, how come the Levites have no hereditary? Ah, so the Le what was the job of the Levites? Well, they were in the temple. Serve the priests. Hmm? Serve the priests. Right, and, and among the Levites were the priests. I mean, the, the Kohanim were a segment of the tribe of Levi, right? Moses and Aaron were of the tribe of Levi, and Aaron's descendants were the Kohanim, the priests, but the rest of the tribe of Levi were the Leviim, the Levites, and they didn't get a portion of land. When the, land. when the Israelites came into the land, 
This is beforehand, but this is predicting what's going to happen because it's instructions on when you come into the land, this is what will happen, right? And each tribe gets a, a, a territory, gets a segment of land. The Levites didn't get a segment of land because they weren't farmers they, or, or herdsmen or, or whatever. Their job was to be the ritual functionaries. Okay, so they were supposed to serve the priests. They were supposed to take care of all of the stuff having to do with the sacred cult. Okay, so they didn't have land. So the tithe was what fed them. And the various other taxes or um, donations was how they, um, they survived, they and their families. <clears throat> Line 28, it talks about doing this every third year. Yeah. What happens in years one and two? Okay, so it's a little confusing, isn't it? So let's see. Um, first of all, well, we're going to get to the sabbatical year a little bit later, but we have a cycle of years. <coughs> every seven years, there's nothing planted. So you have two, three-year cycles, and you don't have to bring this every year. My guess is that for many people, at least they were predicting, that it would be an onerous responsibility to have to go to this particular place every year, to make pilgrimage every single year, because they were going to be spread out. Um, so they would, they would do this. But there are also different interpretations. We don't have um, um, It's not clear. I mean, we can look up at some of the other places as well. Uh, there are some of the things that you can do in your own territory, and there are other places that you have to do in the place that God will designate, which ultimately becomes what? Israel. Jerusalem. No, it's all in Israel. It's all in the land of Israel, or greater Israel, as it were, because a couple of the tribes were on the east bank of the Jordan. Um, but, uh, so imagine you have, and, and then there's also a question of what, what is required of this because it does specifically mention grain, wine, and oil and the first things. So does that mean if you grow apples that doesn't count because it's not grain, wine, or oil? Maybe. And what about a firstling that isn't acceptable for a sacrifice? So that you can eat at home. So, yeah. Were they all the same year, or did they alternate? You know, like my family did one thing and your family did another? You know, I don't know the answer to that. That's a good question. Um, certainly the sabbatical year was the same for everybody. Um, you couldn't this guy in sabbatical, although that would have been much more convenient for me. Because <laughs> then you could eat your neighbor's food. Um, but anyway, um, it's, you know, we're, the notion here is that you have to set aside a tenth of the yield of whatever it is that you're growing. Okay, first of all, well, it, it's both for Farmers, so what it is that you're growing, what grain and, and that sort of thing, or oil means you've been growing olive trees and you press the olives for the oil, right? And wine means you're growing grapes and you press the grapes for the wine, right? So those are all farmer uh, occupations. And then herds and flocks means they're shepherds, right? Okay. Um, hmm? I was just wondering if they share, in other words, if you're a, an agriculturist and you're growing things, and you're not tending flocks. How do you get your meat? Do you oh, you trade. trade. Absolutely. Right Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And it could be that some people have both. You know, you would have a. But it, they're not necessarily. You know, shepherds tend to be a little more mobile. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, um, anyway, so you you take ten percent of this. 
and the and it's not yours. Okay, you you have to. Um, Actually, the time here it says that you can consume it in this place. So you're going to take it to this place that God designates and then have a party. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. right. Um, you consume them in the presence of the eternal God. Okay? And if, if it's too far, then you can cash out and bring the money and then spend it at the local pub <laughs> when you get there. So maybe it's that the tithe, the full tithe is every third year, and that's what you bring to the Levites. So they get the full amount. And I don't know if it's, ever, if it's necessarily the same for everybody. Um, everybody has good questions. There's another uh, mention of the tithe in Deuteronomy 12, 17. Um, and this has to do with location. That's on... Um, it says, you may not partake in your settlements of the tithes of your new grain or wine or oil or of the firstlings of your herds and flocks or of any of the votive offers, offerings that you vow or of your free will offerings or of your contributions. These you must consume before the eternal your God will place that the eternal your God will choose. You and your sons and your daughters, your male and female slaves, and the family of the Levite in your settlements, Happy before the eternal of God in all your undertakings. Be sure not to neglect, neglect the family of the Levites as long as you live in the land. Um, I mean, part of this is the centralization of the worship system. You're not going to have local sanctuaries. It's all going to be centralized. Um, and the Levites will also be uh, centralized. They're not going to be all over the place. Um, but what I really want to ask you is not the details of how this works, because I don't think we're going to necessarily go out and do it tomorrow. Um, but is, is it a tax or a donation? Or both? I think it's how you look at it. It's okay. your perception. So, go on. If you feel that willingly want to give and it's a donation, but if you feel it's uh, forced upon you, then, then it's a chance. Well, it is forced upon you. There's, I mean, it's, it's a compulsory donation, even if it's a donation. Yes. Even if you yes. don't like it. There's what's the enforcement. See, God said God so. Said so. <laughs> How's he gonna, I mean, if you don't, how does he collect? So it uh, is, uh, because if you don't obey the laws, you won't have crops next year. You won't get rain in its season. I mean, that's part of the, that's the Deuteronomic theology. You do what you're told, or the heavens will, will dry up, close up, and you won't get rain in its season, and terrible things will happen to you. I, I mean, you know, I don't want to, no, shut you down for that, but I mean, no, but you can give and everything, and it can still not rain. That's the problem with the Deuteronomic theology. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that. <laughs> yeah, that was just leading to the same observation that farmer A gives, farmer B does not. So suddenly it doesn't rain on farmer B's land, but it does on farmer A's. Meteorologically, it's <laughs> difficult to do that consistently. Well, you could say that that's why everybody needs to because everybody's responsible for everybody else's. You know, I mean, you, you, you could say that if you believe that your donating or collecting tithes actually control the brain. Um, it's a little far-fetched, but... The tithe to the temple is different than leaving the corners of the Yes, temple. that's something else. That is totally different. Right. Yeah, I guess the bigger question to me is what is the purpose of all this? What is God trying to prove? Is this to help everybody or to him or to socialize the 
Well, if it's, it seems to me, let's hold your question because it's a really good one, but maybe we have other, little other comments before we get to them. Jimmy is uh, teaching you how you're going to live your life. In other words, you have an obligation, either monetary or physical, to God and man. And it teaches you that, it teaches one, that no matter how much you have, some of it has to go for the greater good, for the common good. Um, it's sort of like giving your child an allowance and say, okay, here's your five dollars a week, but you give me a dollar back, or you put it in the tzedakah box and you go to temple, because that's what you're supposed to do. So I see it as a, as a learning experience. Okay. Um, it seems to me that, that if it's a tax, or as a tax, it's supporting the spiritual infrastructure of the community. It's supporting the Levites, and um, otherwise they can't function in, in their duties to do the whole sacrificial stuff and, and eventually the temple. I mean, that, you, you, know, you need the upkeep. You've got to pay the dues to keep the temple going. Um, if it's a donation, it, we might think about it in terms of supporting the poor. It's, in a sense, it's a tax that supports the welfare system, right? Because the, the infrastructure of, of this whole thing about the notion of giving 10% or setting aside, it doesn't say donate. It says, you know, you set it aside because in a sense, it's telling you that it's not yours. You're the farmer, you raise the crop, but 10% of it doesn't belong to you. You can't, you can't, or it can only be used for designated purposes. So you can use it for this celebration when you go to the, to the sacred place where God's name will dwell. Um, and you can use it for the celebration there, but you can't just have it for lunch on Thursday. Yeah, I guess that's where I'm very confused, I hope. Because essentially, as I read it, I'm not trying to think something else possible, um, it is set aside to be consumed. Right, yes. but when you go and consume it at that place, it's also going to be, you know, you're, you're not just taking your own little picnic basket and eating it by yourself. When you bring it there, it's the, the stuff is going to be offered up, and so the Levites and their families, and also the poor and the, does it, um, or the stranger, fatherless, and widow, um, will also be able to eat and partake of, of that celebration. And then the third year, yeah, the third year stuff is a little confusing. So I, if you don't mind, we'll just sort of let it go because it's not really relevant to what, what we're talking about. So we'll go back to your question. Back to this. So 2015, we're all going to go to the place and the whole year we're going to have something to eat or is this just the weekend? Or? No, so first of all, these laws only apply to the land of Israel and only to agriculture at least according to the rabbinic interpretation of the Bible. So this was, um, all of the laws pertaining to the land of Israel were of great concern when Jews went back to Palestine in the late 19th and early 20th century and started having agricultural settlements. You know, what were they supposed to do in this eventful year? We'll, we'll get to that in just a minute. But, um, and, and what does it mean in our day and age to tithe? You know, we, we don't generally, most of us are not farmers or shepherds, am I correct in assuming that? Although, you know, if we have a backyard garden, should we take 10% of what we grow and bring it to the food pantry? Would that be an appropriate way of observing this mitzvah in our day and age? I think it's actually a pretty good one. Um, and what is it that we produce then? Now, this even gives us the opportunity and the 
possibility of cashing out because if it's too far and you know the stuff is going to spoil or the animals won't travel that far or whatever, you can you can turn it into money. You can monetize the asset and uh, and then take that with you and, and spend it. So if produce can be monetized, then we can think about our production, whatever that in whatever form that is and wonder whether we have an obligation to tithe, and then what do we do with that? It can't just be for having a party, but do we give 10% of our assets or of our income to some sort of, you know, supporting the spiritual infrastructure and the welfare system in our day and age? Now, we certainly give at least 10% to the federal government and the state government in the form of taxes, right? This didn't include whatever, you know, kings collected. Uh, this, although this was actually at this time, maybe it did. Um, it was kind of, uh, later, there's, there's a whole thing, of, well, we'll get to that, we'll get to this um, um but the question is, you know, do we have an obligation to tithe? There are churches in the United States where their members tithe. They take 10% of what they earn and they give it to the church. Halavai, all of the Jewish community would have that spirit of generosity and take 10% of their earnings and give it to the Jewish community in one way, shape, or form. That's very nice. Um, but it, I think that in a sense, the notion of tithing reinforces our status as tenants. Does that make sense? That we don't have total control over our produce because we don't actually own it. We don't own the land, even though we think we might have a deed to it, but ultimately God owns it. And we think we can control it, but we don't control the rain. And we don't, I mean, we can try to control the soil quality and, and things like that, but there are things beyond our control. Um, so having to take a portion of it and sharing it either by will or by goodness of our hearts um, reminds us that it's not ours. Um, it also seems to me that, that this kind of compulsory sharing, which we don't like to think about. I mean, you know, it's sort of like, you know, when you explain to Gentiles about the difference between charity and tzedakah, you know the word, word charity? It's a very nice word. Do you it comes from the Latin caritas, meaning heart, like cardiac, the same root. It means you're giving uh, out of the goodness of your heart, literally. That if your heart so moves you, then you give. But what if your heart doesn't move you and that guy is still hungry? Tzedakah means justice and righteousness, and it's an obligation whether you feel like it or not a very different way of looking at the world. Um, so in a sense, this, the, even the consciousness of tithing, of setting apart a portion of what we earn, or what we produce, or what we have. I mean, some people don't produce anything. And some people don't actually earn anything. Their assets earn for them. Um, they're, they're earning. I mean, but but the notion of setting apart a portion of that for others, for the common good, whether it's for the poor and the widow and the orphan, or for supporting the spiritual infrastructure of the community, may bring some aspect of kedusha, of holiness, of sacredness, into a very profane, very mundane part of our life. I mean, money is the most 
mundane thing around, but it can be made sacred if we think about it that way. I think that it's not in man's nature to share, so that we have to be taught to think of children because if we do it that way, and anthropologically, a child doesn't know to share, and you have to teach them why why you share. I remember my eldest son and I said, you share that with your brothers? I mean, break it in half, he looked at the little piece and the big piece, and he would grab a little piece. You know, and without, uh, fairness never was a part of it until they were taught, and giving is not something that people do naturally. So we, we, we try to teach empathy and we try to teach sharing in those because those are values we admire. By the way, I, we always used to use the system that if they were going to share, one would cut and the other would choose. Right. <laughs> makes the cutting much more equitable. <laughs> um, but I, I do see, you know, I mean, you, you, you always have the two year old with, with everything is mine, mm -hmm. right? But I also see little children who naturally are empathetic and naturally share and, you know, kind of take care of each other. Or so it's just a study. Yeah. Done. And uh, human beings by nature, they said in this study, are have empathy and compassion. We differ than the animal world in that regard. They see the difference between fairness. Yeah, and I mean, really. Something that we can certainly promote, and, and that I hope we do promote that with, our, with the children and, and with adults as well, because some of those sharing things that we teach them as children, they forget once they grow up. Um, so, one of the things it talks about here is the firstlings of the herds and flocks. What's a firstling? Firstborn. First the firstborn. So, it's the firstborn of that animal. Okay, so each. Each mama goat or mama sheep, the first time she gives birth, that that uh, firstborn is set aside. It's kadosh. It's God's. It's, God's. it's for God. It's for God. Now, what if it's blemished that it's not acceptable for a sacrifice? Then you can eat it at home. You can keep it and, and eat it for yourself. You you can still enjoy it. So let's look at the the. Um, Let's look at the, the laws of first fruits, because that's one of the meets both about the land that Peter Maimonides mentions in his uh, listing of all of the meets both. Um, Deuteronomy 26, verse 1. Now, this is a wonderful passage. In the cloud, it's 
the preparation for entering the land, and it tells you what's going to happen when you get it. Okay, so you take the first fruit of the soil, and you put, so what does that mean, practically speaking, just, just so we understand what we're talking about? First harvest. Yeah, okay, so you, you've got a whole field, and the first, the, the first stuff that you pluck, the grain or, or the whatever, whatever is ripe first. Okay, and you, you take some of everything. So you're growing some wheat here and some barley there, and you got a pomegranate on the tree, or I don't know if they're going to write the same time. Pomegranates aren't July or autumn. Anyway, but you take some of the first fruits, right? And you put it in a basket and you go to the place, the designated place. Um, and you go to the priest and you say, I'm acknowledging before God that I've entered the land that God has promised to us. Okay? Let's go on. Uh, the priest shall take the basket from your hand and set it down in front of the altar of the eternal your God. Clear? Now, the next section is history. Okay, so the next section is different, but listen carefully and also think about where you might have heard it before. Okay, somebody else want to read? You shall then recite as follows before the eternal your God. My father was a fugitive Arabian. He went down to Egypt with meager numbers and sojourned there. But there he became a great and very populous nation. The Egyptians dealt harshly with us and oppressed us. They imposed heavy labor upon us. We cried to the Eternal, the God of our ancestors, and the Eternal heard our plea and saw our plight, our misery, and our oppression. The Eternal freed us from Egypt by a mighty hand, by an outstretched arm and awesome power, and by signs and portents, bringing us to this place and giving us this land land flowing with milk and honey. Wherefore, I now bring the first fruits of the soil which you, eternal one, have given me. Um, so let's, let's just do, do two more verses. Or actually, go through verse 11. So finish that. You shall leave it before the eternal your God and bow below before the eternal and you shall enjoy together with the family of the Levite and the stranger in your midst all the bounty that the eternal your God has bestowed upon you in your household. Okay. Um, and actually, then it, it's going to continue and talk about the tithe again. So if somebody just wants to read that section 12 to 15, or you can skim it yourselves. Um,
What is this history lesson? You owe God for what he did for not only you, but for your ancestors. So this is why we have to make this donation. Okay. But why do you have to say it? Why, why do you have a formula to recite? I mean, you, you will say, you shall then recite as follows. I mean, this is, this is an exact formula. It's like Passover that we say the Hagar. Well, this, this is in the, so where did we recognize this from? Uh -huh. This passage has been put into the Haggadah, which is fascinating. I mean, that this is one of the passages we read. But in fact, it's about, it's, it's the formula about Shavuot, the, the festival of the first fruits. You know, that's when you bring the first fruits in the basket, and then it's, it's the Feast of Weeks. But so, but why, why can't you say, okay, thanks a lot, God, I understand. This is the establishment, the written Torah is the establishment of how we should live our lives, and also in that living, to always remember, because that's one of our big commandments, is it not to remember. And so if you, if you say, I believe in the United States of America, that's fine. But if every day you're a kid and you start off the day by saying, I pledge allegiance to the flag, you get that so ingrained into you that, that it's, it's not a knee jerk, but it's an automatic, evocative situation where you know how important it is to be an American. And we're here, it's why it's so important to recognize the fact that it is God's, not ours. And there's a reason for everything. Giving, and we need to remind ourselves of that reason. Any other thoughts? I mean, I have a theory about this. I, I, I know you're not surprised that I would have that. just bringing in the stuff and saying thanks a lot isn't really enough, that it doesn't, that the real offering is the understanding of where you came from. This is all the baggage I bring along with me. This is who I am. This is where I came from. This is where my Zeta was. And all of this happened. All I, I am a product of that history as well as the farmer who was lucky enough to grow this grain. And I couldn't be who I am without all of that behind me. And so I have to acknowledge before God that I get it. That I have these roots, I have this history, I have this heritage. My family went through all kinds of stuff keeping in mind this promise that someday their descendants would be able to live in this land flowing with milk and honey. And now I'm here, and I got to do this, and wow. I mean, that's, that's as much the offering as the stuff in the basket. You think so? I mean, I, I find this amazingly compelling and um, the fact that they they built that in tells us a lot about the authors and what they understood about the meaning of ritual, the meaning of memory, um, the necessity of keeping history alive on a regular basis from generation to generation. It's, it's an astounding speech, you know, that you have to recite this every time you bring these first fruits. It's not enough just to bring the stuff and say, okay, thanks a lot. You have to put yourself into that history and understand your place in that stream of history. And so that's, an, that's a heck of a lot to expect from some farmer. I, I mean, I, I find that I find it really uh, compelling. So it's like it's a teachable moment for the farmers, is it not? Absolutely. Oh, yeah, I mean, I mean that, that, 
that's that's what it's amazing. You know, just like in Pesach, when we say, you must tell your child on that day, this is what God did for me when I went out from Egypt. Me, personally. Because I have collective memory. I'm part of a collective memory of a people. Even though I physically wasn't there, maybe, but I spiritually was there. And it's part of my memory. I'm going back to where I've never been. Um, okay, so that's that's kind of why this little historical context is a necessary part of the offering. Um, let's look at another topic about the land and what we do with it. And that's Leviticus chapter 25. So we're going to go back, 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 Leviticus, remember that? So chapter 25 will be... One, exactly. In the women's commentary, it's 749. And in... The plout, it's on page 850. 850 in the blue books. <laughs> Do we have a reader? At, at 25 1, the beginning of the chapter. Page 850 in the. No, that's, that's just the introduction. Text. Leave the commentary for The eternal one spoke to Moses on Mount Sinai. Speak to the Israelite people and say to them, When you enter the land that I assign to you, the land shall observe a Sabbath of the eternal. Six years you may sow your fields, and six years you may prove your vineyard and gather in the yield. But in the seventh year the land shall have a Sabbath of complete rest. A Sabbath of the eternal. You shall not sow your field or prune your vineyard. You shall not reap the aftergrowth of your harvest or gather the grapes of your untrimmed vines. It shall be a year of complete rest for the land. But you may eat whatever the land during its Sabbath will produce. You, your male and female slaves, the hired and bound laborers who live with you, your cattle and the beasts in your land may eat all its meal. Okay. So, well, let's let's read a little bit further and get the, the uh, jubilee as well. Okay. You shall count off seven weeks of years, seven times seven years, so that the period of seven weeks of years gives you a total of 49 years. Then you shall sound the horn loud in the seventh month on the tenth day of the month, the day of atonement. And you shall have the horn sounded throughout your land, and you shall hallow the fiftieth year. You shall proclaim release throughout the land for all its inhabitants. It shall be a jubilee for you. Each of you shall return to your holding, and each of you shall return to your family. That fiftieth year shall be a jubilee for you, shall not sow, neither shall you reap the aftergrowth or harvest the untrimmed vines. For it is a true belief. It shall be holy to you. You may eat only the growth direct from the field. Okay. So let's stop. Um, now I don't want to go into all the nitty gritty about the sabbatical year. Um, suffice it to say though that it was practiced. We do know that from historical records. Um, it still is, it still is um, in, in among, so there are Orthodox Jews in the land of Israel who will not eat anything that was grown by Jews in the sabbatical year. So what do they do? There are a couple of interesting legal results. One is they will buy from the Palestinian territories. They will buy imported produce. Or there are Jews who will 
sell their land for the year to a Gentile, so they create the legal fiction. It's like selling your comments during Pesa, um, so that you're not technically the owner of it, and therefore you can still you can still um, sow and reap and all of that, which defeats the purpose. <laughs> Counting the dilemma. Yes. Six years you harvest, the seventh year the land rests. Right. Year 49, the land rests. Ah, then you've got two years of, yeah, it's a problem. And so that's why the next verses after that go into all of the legal ramifications of what's going to happen and can you, what happens if you want to sell, you know, if you sold the land but everything is going to revert back in the Jubilee year. And there's a whole thing in the Talmud where they go on and on and on about all of the legal ramifications because you've got two years of, of not, and of course, you know, the, the rabbis tell us that God will provide enough in the, in the years before and you will know that it's coming so that you can put away so that you'll have enough food stored up, sort of like Joseph was doing in last week's portion um, in Egypt with the seven years of, uh, of plenty and then the seven years of famine. Yeah. yeah well, what happens if those years preceding this, you barely got enough to eat. You got that when you're supposed to start to, to, to obey the Well, law. you know, it's interesting. I mean, there, there, there are historical, um, in, in, in some of the essays, they, they talk about there was a case where, for example, a, um, let, me, let me find this in the, in the essay, because it was, we do know, for example, from Josephus, um, that Caesar changed the um, the amount of taxes that were due from from the Jews in in Palestine during the sabbatical year. Julius Caesar changed the tax amount because of because he knew that there wouldn't be as much uh, pay, you know money to pay. Um, Ah, the, the first book of Maccabees reports that in a sabbatical year, the city of Bethsur surrendered to the Syrians, being unable to withstand a siege for lack of provisions because it was a sabbatical year. Mm -hmm. So I mean, so we have historical references in other sources that say that this actually was observed, that people, that people did this. So aside from the economic hardship it might impose, what might be the positive aspect of having a sabbatical year? For the, having, giving the land a Sabbath. Okay. Fertility for the soil. Okay, so the soil gets to rest. Our biblical ancestors understood depletion of soil and the consequences. Okay? I mean, I guess you could figure that out pretty easily if you just watched for a few years. That if you keep sowing in the same soil over and over and over again, it's going, it's not going to have the same nutrients that you need to feed it in some way and, and you know, I don't know if they did, you know, rotation of crops or something like that, but they understood that the soil could become depleted and their solution was just to let it rest. That just like we have Shabbat every week, the land should have Shabbat every seven years and the land should rest. Now, it does have rather dire economic consequences, particularly in the things that people brought up. I mean, if, if the years going up to the sabbatical year are not particularly productive years, then you're in big trouble. Or, you know, so that we can assume that sometimes it was observed in the breach, that not everybody observed it. Um, and there's a, it's also a little bit confusing where it says, um, you know, you shouldn't reap the aftergrowth or gather the grapes of the untrimmed vines, but in fact, those can go for the poor, but then the rabbis say, well, everybody was basically put into the situation of the poor, so in fact everybody could use that. Um, again, 
you don't have control. That's one thing that, every, that everybody, even the wealthy landowner, is put into the situation of kind of scrounging for something to eat for that year. Wow, what an equalizer. Now, we would assume that the wealthy landowner would have put things aside and would have had a nice store host, house of food, but there's also a requirement to share that and to let anybody go on to the land during the sabbatical year and reap whatever he or she want. Um, but, but the notion that the land itself needs a rest is fascinating. Yeah. Is it possible, uh, or is this modern thinking, that one might divide one's land and say, this year we're going to do this area, even in ancient times, and this time we're going to be uh, sure, this fallow. And, and, that, and, and in that sense that people would not starve and would not be without. That's not the way, that's a kind of a crop rotation, right. and maybe one field fallow, you know. The, my guess is that this was one way of getting there. The last thing I think I would want was to For people to start, certainly. Well, and there were also things that, even if you didn't sow them, would continue to produce. You know, uh, even if you don't trim your vines, the grapes are still going to grow. It might not be as high a quality for that particular year, but it gives, you know, and then the fruit trees are going to continue to grow fruit even in the sabbaticals, and, and some natural grasses are going to grow up, and whatever seed was dropped, you know, do you ever get volunteer tomatoes in your garden in the back? I, I've had that, you know, where, no? You know what I'm talking about? It just reseeds itself. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I've just, one year I, I, you know, put the compost on, and then the next thing I knew I had 40-some tomato plants sprouting up out of, and I had no idea what I was going to get, because, it could have been the tomatoes from my garden the year before, or it could have been something I bought at the store, so I had surprises all through the season. I didn't keep all of them. I had to kind of um, give away some of my, my tomato plants, and some of them just kind of, kind of weeded out or winnowed out or whatever. Um, but, yeah, okay, yeah. I was going to ask, is there any remnant of the celebration of the Jubilee? in modern practice? Um, there is, and I'm, I mean, there have been those, particularly in the kind of Jewish environmental community who have been uh, talking about, you know, shouldn't we be observing a jubilee and have kind of everything go back to its original owner kind of thing and that sort of thing. But I don't know if, if they still have the correct count. I don't think that in modern Israel today they're, they're I mean, and it's it, the whole question of what the Jubilee means. I, I would commend you to the essays in the back of the portion. Um, by the way, that, that verse that we saw here, you shall proclaim release throughout the land for all its in, in other translations, in, in the King James and the earlier English translation, it said, proclaim liberty throughout the land to all the inhabitants thereof. Now, where have we seen that? On the Liberty Bell. On the Liberty Bell. So that's this verse from Leviticus. That's where they got that. So whether it's, it's not really, in this context, it's not really liberty, in, except in the sense that it's kind of uh, ali ali income free. It's, it's that everybody goes back to, all the land goes back to its original owners, and people go back to their original holders. They had somehow migrated from one place to another. Everything goes. Um, it's an interesting. Doesn't it cause a lot of chaos? Yes, yes. And and so it seems to me that the sabbatical, that the jubilee year was probably totally chaotic. Mm -hmm. Financially and physically and yes. But if they're not tending their crops, mm -hmm. was it a party year? Mm -hmm. I mean, it seems to be. They blasted the shofar. Um, so they have a horn section going there. But, it, you know, I, I can't quite imagine how it actually worked. It's not clear if it actually did, but they certainly thought about it. Um, I'm, I'm just bringing this whole thing to you just because the, the Bible at least tells us 
that the land is entitled to rest just like we're entitled to rest. And we're entitled to rest just like God is entitled to rest. That you know, we get Shabbat because God rested. And the land gets to rest just like we get to rest as well. Uh, I mean, it's an interesting concept that the land somehow has rights. Or that we, as um, stewards, understand the need of the land to rest. So I mean, the, the rotation kind of thing where, I mean, I think that, that many farmers understand the need to let a certain field lay fallow and to rotate the crop, crops so that they're not depleted. Unfortunately, in commercial farming in America today, we see very little of that except in small family farms and in, in organic farms and things like that. You see much more huge factory farms where they're doing the same corn and soybeans every year or wheat or whatever it is, the cash crops, and they're just putting more um, nitrogen and other kinds of fertilizers on it and all of those chemicals and, and lots of um, pesticides to kill whatever, and then they're genetically modifying the plants so that they're not susceptible to the pests. To the pests. <clears throat> and all of that fertilizer runoff is going into our rivers and going into the lakes, and we're ingesting it. Um, it's, it's a problem. It's a problem. It's well, it's not just the, you know, I mean, you can see, for example, if you ever go down to the Kankakee River, there's some years where the algae bloom is just overwhelming because there was just a whole lot of fertilizer runoff that year. And it's, it's killing the fish in the, in the river, and it's killing, I mean, it's, you know, I mean, you remember the disaster with DDT. Remember Rachel Carson's book, Silent Spring? You know, that was a wake-up call to all of us, but in fact, that's what this is trying to avoid. This is understanding that the land is an organism and that it's connected and that, you know, it's sort of like, you know, you pinch my toe and my elbow hurts. I mean, it's, it, you know, we're, we're uh, it's, it's a, an integrated system where things have consequences, sometimes unintended consequences. Um, Okay, let's, let's, there's one more section that I want us to look at in the text, and then we can play around with some other stuff after. Let's talk about waste. Doesn't that sound fun? Yeah. Okay. I mentioned this last week um, about the cleanliness of the military camp, so we'll find the, the section now. It's in Deuteronomy 23. So 23 verse 13, in the plout it is on page 1329. 1171. And 1171 of the women's commentary. 1329. Okay. Deuteronomy. 22. There's 22, 13. 23, 13. 23, 13. 1176. Okay, 1176 in the women's commentary. 1329 in the vouch. Okay, so this is um, a whole list of, of uh, civil laws, basically. Um, and it starts with rules about soldiers. And um, look at verse 13. Is anybody particularly, any gastroenterologists among us who are used to reading this stuff? Huh? You want to read something? Further, there shall be an area for, your, for you outside the camp where you may relieve yourself. With your ear, you shall have a spike. And when you have squatted, you shall dig a hole with it. Cover up your excrement. 
Since the eternal Yoga moves about in your camp to protect you and to deliver your enemies to you, let your camp be holy. Let that man find anything unseemly among you and turn away from you. Okay, so spike is one translation. There are other translations that say a spade or something. But you have to have some kind of a digging implement that's part of the equipment that every soldier gets so that when he squats, he can dig a hole and cover it up. Now, this is in the Bible. This is in the Torah. This is sacred instruction. Why? Because God walks up it says. Okay, so their around. answer is that God is walking around in the camp, which I find a little strange. <laughs> you know, it's like, you know the old song about God on our side, you know, that somehow, I mean, God's not in the camp of the enemy? Okay, whatever. Well, uh, we know that if you're not going to cover up, you're going to have flies and vermin. It's going to bring other things, disease. So it's unsanitary. We right. know that. Right. Yeah. Okay, good. But they knew it, and they recognized it, and they not only said, fat, that's disgusting, they said, you cannot do this. You must have a designated place. You have to have, you know, dig a latrine or whatever it is that you're going to do so that you don't foul up your camp. Because assumptions is that if you're going to war, this is a, a war that God would be blessing. It would be a war of defense or it would be a war of conquest to somehow sanction by... Um, by God and, and the leadership. And so this is a sacred task. Don't foul it up, literally. Yeah, you had a comment. Well, I, I was, it's interesting, though, because that's a part of normal human beings. And, and we say the blessing, you know, thank you, God, for giving us whole so that we can do what we need to do and all that. Right. So in some ways, it's kind of, it, it's interesting that, you know, on the one hand, it's a blessing, and on the other hand, it's, it's you know, terrible and we have to get rid of it, but I think it's more what Ethel was saying, it's because it's unsanitary and this is right. a reason. Why. Well, it's not that it's terrible. Terrible. Excrement is not a terrible thing, but it is an unsanitary thing. I mean, your body eliminates it because it's not what your body needs anymore. So, and, and you know, there can be disease and flies and all of that kind of stuff, you know, so that it's not good to, you know, have that in your midst or around your food or you know, where you're going to sleep or whatever it is. And they understood this. And they built in san sanitation requirements. But did they also do that like in their homes or in their towns or you know, have a separate area? For well, I mean, in a home, to, you know, generally you would, I, I, I think there were, I think it was understood that you, know, you wouldn't just go in the middle of the winter. Well, right, but I mean, they have separate um, outside. We do know that they had they had requirements to bathe. You know, the whole notion of immersing yourself and bathing. I mean, so in this case, it talks about a, a soldier who has a nocturnal mission. He has to bathe in water, and and then he can re-enter the camp. So the notion of washing yourself was foreign to many other cultures, and it's built in. In, in Israelite culture, you have to have something like a mikvah for ritual purity as well as for physical cleanliness. Which is why people usually bathe their settlements near a river or a lake or some body of water so that they can have water for drinking and also for washing. Yeah? It was well known to use dung, animal dung, as fertilizer. Mm -hmm. but, in, but that wasn't prohibited. Waste of to your well, but those animals are probably herbivores, okay. and so it's basically repackaged straw. It is. It is. Yeah. But they, they, would, they could distinguish <laughs> between so pellets, as it were. Yeah. Um, it's just interesting that they didn't find that. Well, and, and in some some places they burn animal dung as, as fuel as well. So, um, but human waste was, you know, now, have you ever been to um, Kibbutz Lotan in 
in the Negev. Mm -hmm. At Kibbutz Lotan, they have this wonderful environmental education center, and they have composting toilets there. So, and they don't smell bad. And they actually, you know, when it's it's a, a nice seat, you know, in this little room, you know, you go into the stall, and there's a seat there, and you sit down, and and then after you're finished, you put a little bit of the straw or whatever. They have a little shovel there, so you just throw a little bit in. And, and they create their own compost, and it works. Um, so I guess if human waste is, is treated properly, it can be function as fertilizer as well. What they do is Milwaukee sells it. They act as a fertilizer, they commercially. It is the absolutely human waste. Comes out of their sewer system. Yeah, they process sludge. It. It's called malarganite. It's human waste. <coughs> um, you didn't right. Know. That's the ultimate recycle. <laughs> no, no, I think I, I think it's terrific. It makes a lot of sense. Um, there are a lot of places where they use what they call gray water for for uh, watering, you know, plants. Stuff, which is basically, you know, toilet water or, or waste water of some sort that hasn't been re-sanitized and cleaned and, and all of that, so that it's not fit for drinking, but it's okay to water the plants with. Them. Um, but anyway, so so that's stay. Okay. Um, wanted to talk about, about waste, because we had mentioned that briefly last, last week, and I just wanted to show you the text. Oh, the, the other question was about the blessing that we say when we uh, eliminate. Um, it's a wonderful blessing. You know, the Asher Yatsar is the name of uh, uh, the blessing. that says that God has created us with wisdom, has created our bodies with wisdom, and created within us Various vessels and and uh, passageways and if anything that should be open would be closed or anything that should be closed is open, it would be impossible. Now here's where you know that the rabbis had a sense of humor. It would be impossible to stand before the throne of your glory. They really said that. I just find that so cute. I mean, you have heard of the throne of glory is a euphemism for the little room. Um, <laughs> anyway, so it would be impossible to stand before the throne of your glory. Um, and uh, um, so we praise God who, who uh, makes miracles and you know, miraculously heals. Um, it's, it's an amazing blessing because it recognizes the importance of the plumbing Know, the indoor plumbing working problem. Um, our indoor plumbing is. Um, and you know, anybody who has ever had been constipated or had an ulcer or had something that should be closed open and some, or something that should be open and closed will understand the, the beauty and significance and ultimate meaning of such a blessing. And it is miraculous that most of the time everything works. We don't think about it when we go into the small room and do what we need to do. But it is miraculous. I think as, as we gain years, we appreciate these things even more. Or more often. That too. My, my father, Olavis Shalom, used to uh, say that he would get up in the night to make sure the nightlight was still out in the bathroom. <laughs> um, all right, let's go back a little bit in Deuteronomy to, for, to chapter 20, verse 19. So now we're going to learn about more about warfare. It's interesting that we learn uh, 2019, so it's on 1304 in the cloud. 
general living we learn from kind of negative contexts in the Bible. So we learn about um, general sanitation from army equipment. Or we learn about things uh, uh, having to do with warfare. We learn from this context where it's talking about warfare. Or for example we learn about um, respect for every human body and corpse from the instruction that when someone is executed for a capital crime, you can't leave the body out there overnight. You have to take it down and bury it. So if you would do that for a criminal who was executed for a capital crime, how much the more so would you respectfully bury someone who was beloved uh, quickly and respectfully? So we learn from these kind of negative or not very pleasant situations, we can extrapolate and then uh, apply those to kind of more normal function. I mean, it's just an interesting, interesting phenomenon. Okay, so ch verse 19, this is after we've um, gone through all the rules of if someone has built a house and hasn't dedicated, let him go home, lest he die in battle and someone else dedicated. I mean, there's all these wonderful, and someone who is married but hasn't consummated the marriage, uh, let him go home and, and be with his wife, lest he die in battle and somebody else do it. Um, and it's, it's, or someone who's afraid, let him go home so he won't dishearten the rest of the troops. Fascinating. It's, a, it's an amazing passage. That's just before this. But, um, so let's go to verse 19. And we have a reader. When in your war against the city, you'd have to besiege it a long time in order to capture it. You must not destroy its trees, wielding the axe against them. You may not eat of them. You may. You may eat of them, but you must not cut them down. Are trees of the field human? to withdraw before you into the big besieged city. Only trees that you know do not yield food may be destroyed. You may cut them down for constructing siege works against the city that is waging war on you until it has been reduced. Okay. So what have we learned from this? First of all, it's very conservative. I mean, it, I mean it's, it's conserved. Small. Yeah, small C. Conservation. conservation. Well, right, conservation. Yeah, yeah. And also, the this whole section of Deuteronomy is always blown me away because it's just so human. It is so directed to the soul of the people we are to become. And this is another example of that to me, to my thinking. And hope this whole section. So there's an ideal yeah. sort of written in there. So, um, you're waging war. You can't cut down the trees. Come on. Don't be silly. You can cut down trees, but not fruit. Nothing that you can eat from. You still have to provide food. I mean, it's, it's, it's a fascinating passage. It's, it's really quite amazing. Um, although, it's assuming here that most of the trees are are food-bearing trees, fruit-bearing trees. Because it says you must not destroy its trees. In other words, the trees that are really an axe against them. You may eat of them, but you must not cut them. But, and then here's this, this question. Are the trees of the field human to withdraw before you into the city? I mean, I did, you know, you, you have this picture in your head of a tree with little legs you know, running in like a cartoon or something. But, but what an re interesting rhetorical question. Yeah. Why, why is this condoning uh, killing people but not the environment? 
Well, actually, if you look ahead, I mean, if you look back, it says, when you approach a town to attack it, you shall offer it terms of peace. So you give them the opportunity to surrender. Um, then you can take them as forced labor. Um, but then, if they won't surrender, then you, you do battle. Uh, and there are certain, and then, I mean, this is not for National Brotherhood League, but there are certain nations that, um, if you attack them, you have to kill them all. Not, not, um, yeah. um, it's not pretty at all, but I guess, you know, war isn't pretty. So that if you're at war, yeah, people are going to get killed, but I guess they want to assume that um, you don't have to destroy everything. I mean, this is, they yeah. don't use a neutron bomb. Um, but there's a respect for, it doesn't say don't destroy their houses. It, it basically says you can't have a scorch earth policy. You can't destroy all the possibility for this land ever being used for human habitation. Yeah, and then the other thing too is if you're taking over this land and moving into the land, you then would have, you would be able to eat destroy everything, and then it would take years for it to grow back and reintroduce things. So it's, it's either for you, the winner, or if people are going to stay there and you're just going to oversee it, they at least, you don't have to feed them and give them, spend money to take care of them, they'll be able to take care of themselves. Yeah. I was thinking about besieged cities, where there, there's, you know, there are so many descriptions in literature, both biblical and up to the modern day about what happens in a besieged city. You know, you think about the siege of Leningrad, or you think about the siege of Jerusalem when you read about in, uh, the book of, uh, of Eva, Lamentations, or the siege of Sarajevo just a couple of decades ago, where they took every tree in the park and people burned it for fuel because they were freezing. You know, and there was nothing left. People bringing their furniture. I think of the Romans conquered Carthage and they salted the fields and people couldn't yeah. rebuild the city. So the this city. is arguing against that policy. They, they did the same thing in Jerusalem, by the way. When they, when they conquered the temple, they salted Jerusalem. The Romans did. That was, that was part of their MO. Um, such charming folks. Um, but, but this is arguing against that. This is saying that you have to, you know, even if you're involved in something as nasty as war, understand that, you know, it's not just that the, it's not that the trees have rights and we should go out and hunt trees. Um, it's that you want to preserve the nature. I mean, maybe maybe if you're going to be living there, or somebody's going to be living there at some point. And what is the point of destroying something that could be fruitful, literally, or figuratively? Um, let me share with you a couple other texts. So the rabbis took um, in in verse 19. It says. Um, Lo tashchit et itza. Don't destroy its trees. Okay? So tashchit means destroy. So the, the rabbinic term was bal tashchit. Um, and that's the, basically the law against destroying nature. Or wasting things. Destroying things that you don't need to. You know, destroying something just, just because you can. Um, some other texts on this that I wanted to share with you. But I didn't want to make another sheet of paper to kill more trees <laughs> to pass it out to you, so I figured I would not just leave it to you. Um, in, in the Babylonian Talmud, in, in Tractate Kiddushin, it says, whoever breaks vessels, or rips up garments, 
destroys a building, stops up a fountain, or ruins food, is guilty of violating the prohibition of Baal Tashkent. So all of those, in other words, there's a general law of Baal Tashkent, which means don't destroy, or don't wastefully destroy, it might be a, um, a more specific uh, way of doing it. So you break a vessel just because, you know, what would be the problem with breaking a vessel? I mean, think of it as a jar or something. You can't get things to drink or eat without having something in it. Right, you could reuse it. Yeah. Right? You, you have a jar and it held oil or whatever, something, but it could be reused for something else. Think about, I mean, this is in the Talmud, so we're thinking, you know, almost a couple thousand years ago at least, or whatever. So the jars that they had maybe were glass, maybe were pottery the vessels that they use. So you don't just break something. You try to find another another use for it. Um, rips up garments. You repurpose them. Um, destroys a building. Maybe there's something else you can do with that building when you're finished with whatever it is that you were doing. Stops up a fountain. Or ruins food. Right, right. You can't throw. Did all of our mothers and grandmothers say it's a shame? You know, it's it's like the Jewish mother who said, "I got fat from shame." It's a shame to throw this out. It's a shame to throw that out. Right? And my father would say, "Don't let it go to waste. Let it go to your waste." Um, so yeah, I got fat. From um, but but that's very much part, you know, it, it isn't a favorite. I mean, it's a, it's a sin to waste food. We, we understand that, right? Um, okay. Now, Maimonides, in the Mishnah Torah, is talking about this verse that we just read in the, in the Torah. He says, it is forbidden to cut down fruit-bearing trees outside of a siege city, nor may a water channel be deflected from them so that they wither. As it is said, you must not destroy its trees. If a fruit-bearing tree may be cut down, oh, it, I'm sorry, not it, it, a fruit-bearing tree may be cut down, however, if it causes damage to other trees, or to a field belonging to another man, or if its value for other purposes is greater than that of the fruit it produces. The law forbids only wanton destruction. Okay, so I suppose if you wanted to make a cherry wood cabinet, and it wasn't a particularly productive cherry tree anyway, it would be permissible to use the woods for our I saw on Facebook, that's yeah. very exciting. And that's a perfect example. That tree was dead, it was dying, and it's being, it was cut down and being cured for a very holy purpose. But the farmer, who was a member of the congregation, would not have cut down that tree if it weren't dying already. So all these things were observed. Absolutely. Okay. Oh, then yeah. we have from uh, Samson Raphael Hirsch, who was a uh, 19th century. Destruction does not only mean making something purposely unfit for its designated use. It also means trying to attain a certain aim by making use of more things and more valuable things when fewer or less valuable ones would suffice. Or if this aim is not really worth the means expended for its attainment. For example, kindling something which is still fit for other purposes, for the sake of life. So suppose you take a piece of wood that could be an ark or a cabinet or something, and you just throw it into the fireplace. You know, or using the 
olive oil that you might cook with that's really fine and wonderful to put in the oil lamp, where you could have used some other kind of, you know, a lesser grade of oil that would have given you light, but whatever. Um, wearing down something more than is necessary, or consuming more than is necessary. Think about that. On the other hand, if destruction is necessary for a higher or more worthy aim, then it ceases to be destruction and itself becomes wise creating. For example, cutting down a fruit tree which is doing harm to other more valuable plants, and burning a vessel when there's a scarcity of wood in order to protect one's weakened self from catching cold. So, I mean, it's an interesting, you know, it's, it's a balance. And when, one of the things I'd like us to do next week is to talk about some of the ethical dilemmas that are that are facing. Are we turning into pumpkins? We are. Because what I really wanted to do is go through all of these different things and see how these can be applied to our lives. Particularly the Baltash date. And so I want to show you um, a little bit of show and tell here for a second. But one of the I, I've become I don't think fanatical would be necessarily the right term, but passionate about trying not to be wasteful. Um, and so I felt uncomfortable taking a paper cup and a plastic fork and, and all of that because it's just going to go into the trash and it's just, you know, it, and the plastic is more fossil fuels that have been made into plastic and, and stuff like that. Um, I, I finally convinced the sisterhood of my congregation that we should use real cups and real forks and spoons at the Yonik Shabbat and not have all this disposable stuff. Because it makes, it, it makes me cry. I mean, it makes my soul cry to throw away so much stuff all the time that isn't really necessary. Um, so it didn't mean that they had to make sure there was somebody in the kitchen to clean up. Um, but I figured that was money better spent on the nice lady who cleans up than on more disposable garbage. So uh, you probably do a food drive on the high holidays here too. So a few years ago, our bar bat mitzvah class uh, gave a gift. And so the bags we put on the chairs were, were these. And they're reusable grocery bags and with the logo and reduce, reuse, recycle, it's a mitzvah. Um, so how many of you take your own bags to the grocery store? Okay. And I mean, sometimes, <clears throat> sometimes I'll take the, the paper bags if I forget to bring them you know, in my other bag, because I use those to recycle the newspapers, because I still get the dead tree edition of the, of the newspaper. Um, Although we stopped, my husband likes to read the Wall Street Journal, we stopped getting the paper edition, or I call it the dead tree edition, mm -hmm. and he just gets it online now. Um, so that's, that's uh, better. Um, but the plastic bags, again, it's petroleum products from foreign oil brought in here and made, with, processed a whole lot with lots of pollution of the air and the water as a result of that processing and production. And then they become the national flower. They're hanging on the trees, you know, all over the place. So, <clears throat> in some places, they actually charge for bags. My son lives in Silver Spring, Maryland. And I don't know if it's just in the county or if it's in the whole state of Maryland. If you want a grocery, if you want a bag at the grocery store or any other, you know, CVS or whatever, it's five cents mm -hmm. for every single bag. Which I think is terrific. Target gives you five cent credit if you bring your own bags. Anyway, so the homework for next week is to start thinking about the things that we talked about today, the difference. So, you know, how do we apply the idea of tithing or the idea of first fruits or the idea of sabbatical year and letting land? Or all of those ideas embodied in Baal Tashfit and not wasting. 
how do we apply that to our lives in the attempt to bring more kedusha, more holiness into our lives in a practical way and more wholeness to our world? So that's what we're going to do.